على أسعد النبيين وأشرف المرسلين نبينا محمد وآله وصحبه أجمعين وبعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته uh, We thank Allah سبحانه وتعالى for the opportunity to have this program now inshallah and we pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will guide our deliberations uh, from the beginning to the end uh, as we know this is a program being organized by the Islamic Forum of Nigeria on uh, soccer to caliphate and uh, the, the aim the objective is for us to be educated about uh, what is in the soccer to caliphate for us in different aspects of our life, intellectual, economic, political, leadership, and all aspects of our uh, lives as Muslims living in 21st century Nigeria, and to try to learn some lessons from the legacies of the Sokoto Caliphate, and try to apply them in developing ourselves in this uh, 21st century. The topic of discussion today, which is the third uh, in the series, is on leadership values and good governance in the perspective of the Sokoto Caliphate Triumvirate. Uh, we all know the Triumvirates are the three uh, founding scholars and leaders that found the Sokoto Caliphate, uh, Usman bin Fodi, his brother Abdullah bin Fodi, and his son Muhammad Bello. Uh, and the uh, speaker for today, is Professor Salus Ushehu, who doesn't need any introduction, uh, the Executive Secretary of the Islamic Forum of Nigeria, and also the Deputy Secretary General of the Nigeria Supreme Council for Islamic uh, Affairs, um, uh, Niger Nigeria Supreme Council for Islamic Affairs. <clears throat> Professor Salus Ushehu doesn't need any long introduction, but Alhamdulillah, as his students and mentees, we all know that we have learned a lot from him as a scholar who has been able to combine between oratory and being prolific, a scholar, an intellectual, and an activist. He has been able to balance between all this. And uh, alhamdulillah, we have read a lot of his works, including a book that he has written on social justice and leadership responsibilities in Islam, a primer on good governance in Nigeria, in which he made a lot of references to the legacies of the Sokoto Caliphate in terms of leadership values uh, that we are inshallah going to learn more about today. We all know Nigeria, uh, <clears throat> if everybody talks about the challenge of Nigeria, the consensus, almost consensus, is the fact that the trouble with Nigeria, as Shino Achebe said, is nothing but leadership. So uh, inshallah, today we're going to discuss that. And based on our program, uh, which, uh, okay. Now, <laughs> please share the screen, Mr. Chairman, the pro I mean, Dr. Nabil, the program. You have stopped the split screen share. So inshallah, we will first listen to a cry, uh, recitation from the glorious Quran uh, from brother Dr. Nabil Bello before we go to uh, the <clears throat> other aspects of the program, inshallah. Dr. Nabil, bismillah. A'udhu billahi minash shaytanir rajeem. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ولقد سبقت كلمتنا لعبادنا المرسلين إنهم لهم المنصورون وَإِنَّ جُنْدَنَا لَهُمُ الْغَالِبُونَ فَتَوَلَّ عَنْهُمْ حَتَّى حِينٍ وَأَبْصِرْهُمْ فَسَوْفَ يُبْصِرُونَ 
أَفَبِعَذَابِنَا يَسْتَعْجِلُونَ فَإِذَا نَزَلَ بِسَاحَتِهِمْ فَسَاءَ صَبَاحُ الْمُنْذَرِينَ وَتَوَلَّ عَنْهُمْ حَتَّى حِينٍ وَأَبْصِرْ فَسَوْفَ يُبْصِرُونَ سُبْحَانَ رَبِّكَ رَبِّ الْعِزَّةِ عَمَّا يَصِفُونَ وَسَلَامٌ عَلَى الْمُرْسَلِينَ والحمد لله رب العالمين ما شاء الله جزاك الله خيرا for this uh, beautiful recitation from the glorious Quran alhamdulillah i have already introduced the speaker professor salus shehu uh, and inshallah without taking longer time i will uh, request professor salus shehu to make his presentation inshallah wa billahi tawfiq أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن والاهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل الأقدة من لساني يفقه قولي وبعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته let me begin by thanking the moderator uh, for uh, making a very good introduction to the lecture. And uh, I believe he has stated the reasons why we initiated the Sokoto Caliphate Lecture Series. We need to educate the world about the legacies of the Sokoto Caliphate leaders the intellectual legacies of the Sokoto Jihad leaders. But much more importantly, we need to educate our younger ones who do not who know next to nothing about uh, the history of the Sokoto Jihad, the history of the Sokoto Caliphate, and the relevance of that history to our present circumstances and uh, contemporary situation. So I don't have to take much time on that. And it has also been stated that this is the third lecture in the series. And there, are going, there, are, there will be about five more lectures, inshallah, on the Sokoto Caliphate lecture series. The topic of my presentation as stated by the moderator is leadership values and good governance in the perspective of the Sokoto Kali triumvirates. This word triumvirates means the three leaders, the three uh, intellectual leaders of the Sokoto Jihad or of the Sokoto Caliphate, meaning Sheikh Usman Danfodio Rahimahullah, Sheikh Abdullah bin Fodio Rahimahullah, and Sultan Muhammad Bello Rahimahullah. Now, the outline of my presentation on this uh, topic will be as follows. The first thing I will discuss is the importance of leadership and the significance of political authority in Islam. Then I will discuss the crisis of leadership and the quest for responsible leadership and good governance. The next thing is an attempt to define good governance, both from the Islamic pers from the conventional perspective and the, the Islamic perspective. Then I will discuss the Sokoto Jihad leaders, 
I will give a, a general resume, just a brief one, about the biography of the Sokoto Jihad leaders. Then this will be followed by a general overview of the writings of the Sokoto Jihad leaders on leadership, politics, social justice, and uh, good governance. The next thing will be discussion of specific perspectives of the Sokoto Jihad leaders on leadership and good governance. And then the next thing, or the, the final thing will be conclusion and recommendations. Now, talking about the importance of leadership in Islam and the significance of political authority, uh, we, wouldn't, we wouldn't have to take long time discussing this. Uh, in an hadith that is reported by Abu Dawud, the Prophet ﷺ demonstrates to us the importance of leadership when he says that when three persons are going to travel, they must appoint one of them to lead them, that is to be their leader. Now, on the basis of this and many other uh, sources of Sharia, Sheikh Abdullah ibn Fodio in the Ya'ul Hukam says, let it be known that appointing a leader is obligatory upon Muslims based on sources of Sharia and also the ijma of Muslim scholars, that it is an ijma. There is a consensus among Muslim scholars that appointing leaders is obligatory. Muslims cannot stay without leadership. It will be an abomination that a society or community stays without leadership. Other scholars that affirm this position include Ibn Hazm al-Andalusi, uh, when he says that there is an ijma, there is a consensus among all Muslim scholars, among the Sunni, the Shia, the Murja, and the Khawarij, that there is a consensus across all these groups that appointing a leader is obligatory. Sheikh al-Islam Ibn Taymiyyah made the same assertion. Ibn Khaldun in Muqaddima also made the same assertion. Now, it is instructive, it is instructive uh, to note that even in animal communities, there is leadership. There is hierarchy of leadership. There is distribution of roles and distribution of duties and responsibilities, even among uh, animal communities. The Quran has affirmed that. The Quran has told that there is leadership among animal communities. In the story of Sulaiman alayhi salam in Surah to naml Allah tells us the command that was given by the queen ant to her fellow queen, that they should all retire to their halls, lest they be smashed by Suleiman and his horse. Ya ayyuhan lam nudkhulu masakinakum la yahtimannakum Suleiman wa junuduhu wa hum la yashurun. In Islam, all the, five, all the five pillars of Islam are governed by leadership and they are being carried out through leadership. They are being executed through leadership. Kalima to shahada, for example, if a person wants to convert to Islam, he must declare kalima to shahada before a Muslim leader. And then salat cannot be performed in congregation without leadership. Zakat is, can only be executed with leadership. The same thing about fasting. A leader has to declare that fasting should begin and fasting should end when the month of shawwal is cited and so also about Hajj. None of the Islamic pillars can be executed or can be observed or conducted or carried out without leadership. This reminds me about uh, a wise saying on, of one of the pre-Islamic poets, of Af, uh, Al-Afwa, Al-Awadi, when he says, La yasluhun nasu uh, fawda la surata lahum. That people's affairs will never be good without an organized leadership. 
So leadership is necessary in human communities, but even much more necessary in Islamic communities. What about the essence of leadership and the significance of political authority in Islam? The Quran has told us about the essence of leadership and the significance of political authority in Surah Al-Hajj, verse 41. That is chapter 22, verse 41, where Allah says, الَّذِينَ إِمَّكَّنَّاهُمْ فِي الْأَرْضِ أَقَامُوا الصَّلَاةَ وَآتَوُوا الزَّكَاةَ وَأَمَرُوا بِالْمَعَرُوفِ وَنَهَوْا عَنِ الْمُنْكَرِ وَلِلَّهِ آكِبَةُ الْأُمُورِ Those Muslim rulers who, if we give them power in the land, they enjoin compulsory observance of regular prayers, the payment of zakat, and they enjoin goodness and righteousness, al-ma'aruf and al-munkar. They forbid evil, that is munkar, and with Allah rest the end of all affairs. So in Islam, leadership is about establishing the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on earth, establishing morality and moral uprightness on earth, enforcing moral uprightness on earth, and establishing justice, as it is also indicated in Surah Tusad, in the, his, in the story of Dawood alayhi salam, where Allah says, Ya Dawood, inna ja'annaka khalifatan fil ardi fahkum bayna nasi bil haqq, wa la tattabi il hawa an paydillaka an sabilillah. Inna alladhina yudilluna an sabilillahi lahum adabun alimun bima nasu shadibun bima nasu yawm al hisab. So the essence of leadership in Islam and the significance of political authority in Islam is about establishing the worship of Allah, establishing justice and fairness on earth, and enforcing morality on earth. It is instructive to note that both Sheikh Usman bin Fodio and Abdullah bin Fodio in their Usiyasat and in their Ul-Hukam respectively. That is to say, Sheikh Usman bin Fodio in their Usiyasat Sheikh Abdullah al Fodio in Diabul Hukam mentioned this duty about enforcing the laws of Allah, establishing justice, and prohibiting evil as the cornerstone of leadership, the primary essence and significance of leadership in Islam. Now, what is it that motivated us to discuss about leadership? in the perspective of leadership values and good governance in the perspective of the Sokoto Jihad leaders. What actually motivated us is that there is actually a crisis of leadership. Like the moderator started saying, there is crisis of leadership. And hence, the quest for good governance is you know, becoming more and more you know, momentous, ubiquitous. So, there is crisis of leadership. But I want to look at this crisis of leadership from two dimensions. In the first dimension, I, I am worried about the, the, the leadership crisis within Muslim societies, within Muslim organizations, <clears throat> and within <clears throat> Muslim communities. What characterizes uh, the problem of leadership in many Muslim organizations and Muslim communities is incompetence, ineptitude, and naivety in leadership, lack of proactiveness and tactfulness in leadership, insensitivity and lack of responsiveness in leadership, lack of vision, lack of sense of mission, and there is usually no planning, no strategic thinking among many Muslim leaders in Muslim organizations, in Muslim communities, and in Muslim societies, and even at a global level, you can see Muslim countries are the most challenged in terms of the issue of leadership. Unfortunately, Muslim, many Muslim countries today are, are in disarray. Many Muslim communities are so destabilized because of the crisis of leadership. Now, when you look at it from the perspective of our national living, that is in the Nigerian perspective, leadership crisis has become so endemic so endemic that ordinary Nigerian today loses hope about the possibility of getting responsible leadership. Unfortunately, we can see the monumental corruption that is taking place even in the present dispensation. 
Look at the monumental corruption that is taking place. Impunity has come to gain ground in Nigeria. Like somebody says, corruption and poor leadership have become our own weapon of mass destruction. We are living in a condition of war in this country. Even countries that are, that are in war, their conditions cannot be as worse as our own condition in this country because of poor leadership. So there is real crisis of leadership in our country. But even globally, you can see that there is crisis of leadership in many countries. People are yearning for responsible leadership. People are yearning for uh, you know, good governance in all parts of the world. This is attested to by many scholars and by many organizations. Uh, for example, United Nations Economic and Social Commission for Asia and the Pacific asserted that recently the terms governance and good governance uh, are gaining ground, are increasingly being used in development literature because bad governance is being increasingly regarded as the one of the root causes of all evil in our, within our societies. Bad governance is responsible for, you know, poverty. Bad governance is responsible for, you know, all sorts of impunity that is going on in, in many countries, but most especially in our own country. You know, bad and poor schools, very poor healthcare delivery system, very filthy environment, diseases, and all sorts of, you know, very terrible conditions in our own society, in our country. So there is real crisis of leadership. Now, <clears throat> this brings us, I mean, to further assertion that is made about this issue. Uh, when Hassan and Young states that, I mean, stated that issues of good governance are being widely discussed and debated all over the world today. There is today a flurry of activity to better understand not only the social, economic, and political imperatives that underpin the nature and purpose of good governance, but also to appreciate the cultural sources and traditions which have contributed to and influenced the way we govern societies and manage our own business enterprises. This underscores the need for us to look at or to look into the intellectual heritage of the Sokoto Caliphate on issues of leadership values and issues of good governance. Now, uh, the importance of good governance is further, as I mean, emphasized by the late Kofi Annan when he says good governance is perhaps the single most important factor in eradicating poverty and promoting development in the world today. Now, having discussed this, we now move to define leadership and good governance. I wouldn't take time in defining leadership. Many of us know the definition of leadership. But what about good governance? The term good governance as, uh, has been asserted by many scholars. is actually a new term. I can even assert, I can even say that when I was a university student over 30 years ago, I can hardly remember mention of the word good governance. This is a new coinage, good governance. Uh, many scholars have stated that it was first you know, coined by the World Bank and uh, several other development uh, literature. So it's a very recent term. But whatever the case may be, we need to understand it and we need to define it from conventional and from Islamic perspective. In this regard, let me first of all define it from the uh, conventional perspective. Then I will come to see the definition from the Islamic perspective. Good governance, as defined by UNESCO, that is United States and United Nations Economic and Social Commission for Asia and the Pacific. It says good governance is participatory, consensus oriented, accountable, transparent, responsive, effective and efficient, equitable and inclusive, and follows the rule of law. It assures that corruption is minimized and that the views of minorities are taken into account and that the voices of the most vulnerable in society are heard in decision-making 
it is also responsive to the present and future needs of society. This is the definition given by UNESCO. UNDP identified nine characteristics of uh, the definition of good governance, which are almost the same with the one that, I have, that I have, I've just read. These nine characteristics include, number one, participation, observance of rule of law, transparency, responsiveness in leadership, consensus orientation, equity, effectiveness and efficiency, accountability, and strategic vision. This is the definition given from the conventional perspective. And as you can see, this definition is secular. What about the definition of good governance from the Islamic perspective? The concept that is closest to I mean, to good governance in Islam, the concept that is very close to it is the concept of siyasa shari'iyah, as siyasa as shari'iyah, siyasa to shari'iyah. Uh, Sheikh Usman Lamfodio talk about siyasa to shari'iyah in his book, Diya U Siyasat. We will come to refer to it more copiously. Again, we will remember the, the, the book by Sheikh Al Islam Ibn Taymiyyah, as siyasa to shari'iyah, fi islahi ra'i wa ra'iyah. So when we come to look at good governance from the Islamic perspective, one would say from the perspective of siyasa shari'iyah, if we know the definition of siyasa shari'iyah, but we will come to discuss it further, we would say that all the nine characteristics of good governance as identified and enumerated by UNDP, all these are inclusive in the Islamic definition of good governance or in the concept of siyasa as sharia. They are all inclusive. But then the definition of good governance or siyasa sharia in Islam does not stop at these nine points enumerated by UNDP or these things identified by UNESCO. Like I said, they are all included in the Islamic concept of siyasa sharia. But however, the definition of good governance in Islam goes beyond these ones to include necessarily not a matter of, alter, I mean, uh, uh, not a matter of choice, but a matter of necessity. The definition of good governance in Islam must include al amru bil ma'aruf wa nahayu anil munkar that governance must also include enjoining and enforcing righteousness, enjoining and enforcing morality, and prohibiting evil, prohibiting munkarat, all sorts of evils, all sorts of forbidden abominations, al-fahsha, al-fawahish, and haram, must all be enforced. This is a necessary thing in the Islamic definition of <coughs> good governance. As we read in the verse earlier, we, we read from Surah Al-Hajj, الَّذِينَ إِمْ مَكَّنَّهُ فِي الْأَرْضِ أَقَامُوا الصَّلَاةَ وَآتَوُوا الزَّكَاةَ وَأَمَرُوا بِالْمَعَرُوفِ وَنَهُوا عَنِ الْمُنْكَ So good governance in Islam must necessarily include establishing the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is the essence of leadership in Islam. Leadership in Islam would be useless if Salat will not be observed regularly. Leadership in Islam will be useless if Zakat will not be observed. Leadership in Islam will, will, not be, uh, will, will be useless if Zina and all sorts of abominations are allowed to spread in the land. If alcohol will be consumed freely, all these are, you know, munkarat. So in Islam, good governance, in addition to all those things, that are just mundane, good governance in Islam include al amru bil ma'aruf, wa nahyu an al munkar, wa iqamati salah, wa ita is zakah, as the case is always, inshallah. Now, having given this definition uh, of good governance, now let us talk about the Sokoto Jihad leaders or the Sokoto Caliphate leaders in brief. I'm not going to talk about 
when Sheikh Usman Namfodio was born, how he started his education, this and that. I'm not going to go into those details. I will just say one thing. I will just say one thing, which was uh, an assertion that was made by one of the renowned scholars of Sokoto Caliphate, that is Professor Mare Last. Professor Mare Last says the Sokoto Jihad was a revolution of the young, a revolution of the young. And we will just tell us about the Sokoto Jihad leaders from the perspective of this statement or assertion made by Marelas when he says revolution of the young. What does he mean? He means that the Sokoto Caliphate leaders or the Sokoto Jihad leaders and Caliphate leaders were very young people. Even at the point when the Sokoto Caliphate was established, these people were, were very young. When we talk about Sheikh Usman Namfodio, people might think that we are talking of people that are in their 60s or in their 70s. But these were young people. Sheikh Usman Namfodio was born in 1754 and he began preaching in 1774. You can see that he began teaching and preaching at the age of 20. He just began the movement at the age of 20. Sheikh Abdullahi Damfodio was 12 years younger than Sheikh Usman Damfodio. So he was very young. But then what is even more instructive is that at the time when Sultan Muhammad Bello, that is when eventually the caliphate was established, at the time when Sultan Muhammad Bello became the Amir al Mu'minin and the Sultan, he was just above 30 years. He was only above 30 years when he became the Amir al-Mu'minin. And Sheikh Usman Namfodio, when the caliphate came into reality, he was just around 50 years old. You can see they were young people that actually established the Sokoto Caliphate. If there is any lesson in this, especially for our young ones, is that this should inspire us. Those of our young ones, this should inspire us. The most amazing thing is that while these people were young, look at it. They were teaching. They were preaching. They eventually embarked on jihad. Then eventually the, Sokoto, the caliphate was established. They embarked on statecraft and administration. But in spite of all this, and in spite of the, 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 the young age, look at the knowledge they amass. Look at the books they wrote, the Arabic they, they write, and the Arabic they, they, I mean, the, the Arabic they wrote and the Arabic they spoke is superb. You can imagine if they went to any uh, you know, Arab country to study, but they all studied here. But they write Arabic without any blemish. This should inspire the young ones among us. Having said this, let us look at now. Let us go into the real discussion about their perspectives on leadership and on, uh, on, on good governance. First, we begin with a general overview of the writings of Sokoto Jihad leaders on leadership, politics, social justice, and good governance. In the first instance, we need to make the point that Sheikh Usman Tamfodio was out for a general reform, a general religious reform. He came out to reform the religion generally and to revive it as it was being practiced in Hausaland. So the main thrust of the Sheikh's teaching, preaching and writings were first and foremost, the issue of the purification of religious creed, that is Akida, and you know, purification of worship, that is Ibadat, from polytheism, that is from Shirk and from idiosyncrasies, that is khurafat and bidah, innovations, and also teaching people about moral uprightness and the purification of the soul, that is akhlaq and tasawwuf. Now, these are very common things in the writings of Sheikh Usman Namfodio. For example, in Nurul al-Bab, in Wathikatul Ikhwan, in Siraj al-Ikhwan, in Ihya al-Sunnah wa Ikhmad al-Bid'ah, in, you know, many other books, you can see, reflect, I mean, all these issues 
of general religious reform, reform of Aqidah, reform of Ibadah, reform of Akhlaq, from all sorts of shirk and idiosyncrasies. This is from a general perspective. In other words, I'm trying to say that it, they, they didn't come out just for the purpose of political reform. It was a comprehensive religious and social political reform. And this can be seen also when we come to discuss about their writings on social political reform. That is to say, besides the general perspective, let us now focus on social political reform as part and parcel of the overall jihad, the revolution that they embarked upon. Sheikh Ustman Fodio, you know, tells us about their aim at political or social political reform, especially in one of his books, one of his books on political reform, that is Kitab al -Farq. For example, Sheikh Usman Danfodio in this book describes leadership, what he calls leadership of the infidels. Leadership of the infidels, that is leadership of people that don't believe in God. People that lead with tyranny. People that lead with corruption. He says, one of the ways of their government is they're intentionally eating whatever food they wish whether it is religiously permitted or forbidden, and wearing whatever clothes they wish, whether religiously permitted or forbidden, and drinking whatever beverages they wish, whether religiously permitted or forbidden, and riding whatever riding beast they wish, whether religiously permitted or forbidden, and taking whatever women they wish without marriage, whether religiously I mean, permitted or forbidden, and spreading soft decorated carpets as they wish, whether religiously permitted or forbidden. You can see the kind of, you know, mission that Sheikh Usman Lamfordio came out with in terms of political reform. Now, this is about fighting corruption in leadership, fighting fraud in leadership, looting from the public treasury. This is further enunciated in many other writings of Sheikh Usman Danfodio. Now, some of the famous writings of the jihad leaders on social political reform, there are many, they wrote many on social political reform, but some of the famous ones that are presented here, but not chronologically, include, for example, Kitab al Farq, part of what we just read. Kitab al Farq by Sheikh Usman Namfodio. Al Masail al Muhimma, also by Sheikh Usman Namfodio. Diya us Siyasat, by Sheikh Usman Namfodio. And then uh, there is, for example, Bayan Wujub al Hijra by Sheikh Usman Namfodio. There is Usul al-Adil, also by Sheikh Usman Namfodio. When we come to Abdullah Namfodio, we will see that he wrote more than the rest on issues of governance, leadership, and statecraft. One of the most famous of his writings on this is Diablo Kam. There is Diablo Amri wal Mujahideen. There is Diya ul Umara, there is Diya ul Sultan, and so on and so forth. Sultan Muhammad Bello also wrote a number of books on social political reform, leadership values, and governance. For example, the famous among them is his magnum opus, that is Usul Siyasat. And then there is al ghaisul wabl fi sirat al imam al adil there is al ghaisul shu'bu fi tawsiyat amir yaqub and so on and so forth infaq al maysur can also be, be, be considered as one of the books that sultan muhammad bello wrote on issues of governance and leadership 
Now, this is from a general perspective. Let us look at their perspectives on leadership from very specific uh, uh, points of views. Now, on the issue of good governance, as uh, they all stated, that good governance is the essence of politics in Islam. Sheikh Usman, Sheikh Usman Danfodio made it very clear that good governance is the essence of politics in Islam. What he is saying, and I will read, but before I read, what Sheikh Usman Danfodio is saying is that if a, if a Muslim would participate in politics, then it must necessarily be for the purpose of engendering good governance. If as long as you will not, you will participate in politics, not for the purpose of engendering good governance, Sheikh Usman al said, it is clearly and categorically haram to participate in politics. But he says that for the sake of enforcing good governance and engendering good governance and responsible leadership, participating in politics is obligatory. He says in Diya Usiyasat that Siyasa is of two, two categories. There is what he calls Siyasa Adila and Siyasa Zalima. Siyasa Adila and Siyasa Zalima. What is Siyasa Adila? He says Siyasa Adila, that is just and legitimate politics, is the politics that procures people's right from the unjust and from the wicked. It is the politics that also sanctions and reprimands the perpetrators of corruption and evil. This is Siyasa Adila. And he says it is obligatory. I mean, about the latter, it, about Siyasa Zalima, he says it is the Siyasa that perpetrates corruption. It is the Siyasa that perpetrates zulm injustice and tyranny in the society. It is the siyasa that doesn't procure the, 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 the rights of the weak from the wicked ones. And he says, it is obligatory to participate in siyasa adila. That is siyasa that is based on bringing good governance Siyasa, whose intention is about engendering responsible leadership and good governance. He says it is obligatory for people to participate in Siyasa Adila. What are the reasons of Sheikh Usman Lamfodio? He says the reason is that if people that are good refuse to participate in Siyasa Adila, then it means people, it will result, that will result in the neglect of people's right, in abandoning of Sharia laws, and in the emboldening of the corrupt miscreants in the society, as we are seeing today. And it will also open the door of wrongdoing and injustice, bloodshed, and acquisition of wealth unlawfully. If people refuse to participate in Siyasa Adila, and as I said earlier, he says categorically, for these reasons, participating in Siyasa Adila is compulsory, is obligatory. And for the same reason, participating in Siyasa Zalima is haram. That is to say, if a person will participate in politics only to go and promote corruption, only to be partaking in fraud, then it is haram. He should know that he is just dining, eating, and, and, and clothing himself in haram. This is very clear as far as Sheikh Usman Namfudu is concerned. Then, number two, another important thing is Sharia-guided politics is an obligation. I think I've made this point. That is to say, Sharia, Siyasa Adila, which is Siyasa Sharia, Sheikh Usman Namfudu said it is obligatory. Now, coming to issues of social justice, both Sheikh Usman Danfodio and Abdullah bin Fodio have stated that social justice is the essence of leadership and is indeed the foundation of leadership. 
For example, in Dia Sultan by Sheikh Abdullah Al Fodio, he says this is obligatory that the leader must ensure justice, and that means to give every owner of right, of any kind of right, his or her own right duly, regardless of whether it is from oneself. That is, even if the right were from the leader, then the leader must ensure that he give that right to whom it is due. That is Sheikh Abdullah ibn Fodi's definition of justice. He said it makes no difference whether that particular right supposed to be procured were upon the leader himself or upon someone who is close to the leader or among the subjects. The leader must ensure that people's rights are procured and people's rights are given duly. Leadership will be useless if people will not get their own rights, if people's rights will not be protected, especially the most important right is the right to live in and the right to own property. If people will just be, be killed indiscriminately, if people's lives will be unworthy of protection by the state, leadership would be useless. So I think this is very important to emphasize, especially in our present situation in Nigeria, where killings are just going on, unfortunately, on a daily basis. On a daily basis, not in, in, in single digits, not only on, in double digits, but sometimes killings are going on in triple digits. Hundreds of people will just be killed at once. So unfortunate, there were times even the killings took place in, in four digits, thousands of people, like the killing that happened in Baga, where over 2,000 people were killed just at a go. And today, people are just continuously being killed. So the leader must protect people's right. And this is the essence of leadership as far as Sheikh Abdullah Fodio is concerned in, uh, uh, in Diyau as Sultan. What about equality before the law? It is instructive to note that in his Usul al-Adil, while enumerating the principles of justice, Sheikh Usman Danfodio mentioned as the fifth principle that the leader should consider and always see himself as part of and equal to the subjects in respect of all issues, in respect of all complaints, and in respect of all problems presented before him. He, he should see himself as equal to all subjects. Everybody should be equal before the law. A practical illustration of this equality before the law was given by Sheikh Abdullah bin Fodio in Diya ul Hukam when he says, in a very practical illustration, he says, it is in the interest of justice to treat equally any two disputants with regard to their entry into his presence. When two people that are disputing are coming to you as a leader or as a judge, for example, as they are coming to you, Sheikh Abdullah Fodio said, is, is it necessary to treat them in the way you even receive them? in terms of the way they sit, in terms of the way he looks at them, how he addresses them in all matters connected with them without show, showing favor to either of them. Whoever greets him between the two, he should not return the greeting with an excessive mood of cheerfulness, no kindness, and must not talk much to him. That is to say, maybe this one is closer to you in a way. He, they, they greeted you, and then you begin to ask the other person, yeah, 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 how about your children? Uh, well, yeah, Iyali, how is the family? Because this one, you don't know him, you may not ask him those questions. He says, when they come to you as a leader, and there are two disputants, you have to judge between them. You must not even show excessive 
mood of cheerfulness to one of them more than the other. You shouldn't show kindness to one of them more than the other. You should not even talk to one of them more than you talk to the other. Even the way you look at them, meaning that you should not be looking pointedly at one while neglecting the other. This is a practical illustration of equality before the law in a very minute sense as depicted by Sheikh Abdullah ibn Fodio in Diyaul Hukam. Now coming to the issue of, this is uh, uh, what we have just discussed is about the issue of supremacy of the rule of law, equality before the law, right to fair hearing, that is issues about retributive justice. Then coming to the issues of distributive justice in leadership, that is the principle of equal opportunities, equitable distribution of wealth, an equitable distribution of opportunities. People in the society, in the country, must have equal access to opportunities. Opportunities should not be, you know, shared unequally, just as wealth should not be shared unequally. Like Allah says, Kaila yakuna dulatun, dulatan bainal agnia iminhum. In their Ul Umara, for example, Sheikh Abdullah ibn Fodio dedicated a whole section of a chapter on what he calls Masariful Amwal. Masariful Amwal. How wealth should be distributed in, in, a, in a nation or in a country or in a society or in a community. He says, uh, in this section, Sheikh Abdullah he concisely discussed the distribution of zakat and the distribution of the wealth in public treasury, that is Baitul Mal. Then coming to another issue that is very important in leadership is the issue of transparency and accountability in public responsibility and leadership. First, beginning with looting from the public treasury and breaching of trust. In the Ul Umar, Sheikh Abdullah ibn Ford dedicated a whole section or chapter to this, and he captioned it, Fasl al-Fasl, fi ma la yahillu lil-umara'i akhzuhu min al-amwali. Ma la yahillu lil-umara'i akhzuhu min al-amwali. That is a chapter that explains that, that which is not permissible for leaders to take of public wealth. He discussed extensively about the prohibition of taking anything from public treasury based on nusus. And we can recall the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ in which he says, whoever is assigned to any public responsibility and some allowance or salary is, you know, uh, stipulated for him or her, and he takes a needle or anything above it, a needle or anything above it, shall come with it on the day of judgment. In, in, in the Awul Hukam, Sheikh Abdullah Fodio charges leaders on the need to enforce asset declaration and regular auditing of their appointees. That whenever they appoint leaders, that is they appoint governors, or they appoint ministers, or they appoint chairmen, as the case may be, or they appoint, you know, they delegate responsibility. He, in, he says that it is important that they should make them to declare their asset at the point of appointment. And he says, after some time, after some time, he should be undertaking regular auditing. He should be undertaking regular auditing of their, you know, possessions. And he says, Whatever is found, whatever is found of their wealth, which cannot be explained, which cannot be proven to be legitimate earning from their allowances or their salary, he says this should be confiscated and taken back to the public treasury. Whenever an auditing, regular auditing is, 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 is undertaken, that is to say, not in the way we do it now, that when, when an appointee or an electee is finishing his term 
or hatam. Then it is at that point that he will now declare asr for the second time. After declaring for the first time on appointment. So you can see, Sheikh Abdullah ibn Fodio is saying that should, it should be conducted, auditing should be conducted on a regular basis to see whether they have accumulated wealth illegitimately. And whatever is, whatever is got is seen to be illegitimately acquired should be confiscated by the leader. What about taking bribe or any form of gratification in leadership? Sheikh Abdullah ibn Fodio again gave very clear and unambiguous ruling on this in Diya al-Sultan wa ghayrihi min al-Ikhwan. He says, <coughs> of the kinds of wealth that are made unlawful by Allah to the Umara wa ghayrihim, that is wa ghayrihim meaning rulers and others meaning their subordinates, their employees, their, you know, their delegates, isn't it? Whom they delegate a, a responsibility. He said, of the wealth that is prohibited for them is all those are obtained through zulm, injustice, and oppressive exploitation. And one type of zulm, he says, is a risha, a risha bribes given to them, given to the sultan, that is to the, to the president or to the governor or something from one of two disputants or from both of them before rendering justice or even after it, or even after it. So even after judgment, the Qadi or the leader should not take anything from any two disputants. And similarly, acceptance of ordinary gifts by the Sultan from subjects or citizens is the gate of all evils. If a leader will accept gifts from his subjects, so, uh, uh, Sheikh Usman, uh, Sheikh Abdullah Fodio in the Sultan says, that is the gate of all evils. That is to say, even not at the point of Sharia, of you know, uh, litigation, whatever the case may be, even not at that point, just ordinarily, for the leader or Al Ali, for example, to be accepting gifts from his subjects, that is the gate of all evil in the sense that when any situation happens and they are arraigned before you, the person that regularly gives you gifts and you collect, you may not be able to be fair. That is what um, uh, uh, Sheikh Abdullah ibn Fodio means. He says, once, once gifts find inroads to a ruler or leader, justice and equity and righteousness instantly get compromised. They instantly get compromised. They, they are instantly stripped up from him. Now, another issue is delegation of authority based on merit and supervision as cornerstones of leadership and good governance. That is to say, assigning responsibilities and delegating authorities on the basis of trust and on the basis of merit. This is one essential cornerstone of leadership, responsible leadership and good governance. Respect for merit, respect for competence in assigning responsibilities and in delegating authority. The Sokoto Jihad leaders are telling us that this is a cornerstone in leadership. And let me say, let me make this point. Many of us are fond of quoting a statement from Sheikh Usman Amfodio that a nation can survive kufr, but cannot survive injustice. Of course, this, this statement is not only attributable to Sheikh Usman al Fodio, but also attributable to many scholars that have written on leadership. It is, it's usually attributable also to Sheikh Islam Ibn Taymiyyah. But the point I want to make is that many of us make this statement. Little did we, uh, do we know that that particular statement is specifically, specifically, you know, related to this issue of assigning responsibilities based on merit and competence. That is to say, when people are assigned responsibilities and they are delegated some form of state 
function or state duty, not based on competence and merit. It is at that level that that nation cannot survive that kind of injustice. This is very clear in the explanation made by Sheikh Usman Nafodio in Bayan Wujub al Hijra. Sheikh Usman Nafodio in Bayan Wujub al Hijra says, a man was asked why the rule of the Sassanid dynasty had degenerated to the extent it had. He said that was because they had appointed low men to high posts. When lowly people are appointed to hold very high public offices that they don't deserve, then that is the kind of injustice that nations will never survive. This is the interpretation of the, of the, of the verse in Surah to Nisa, which Sheikh al-Islam Ibn Taymiyyah took time to discuss in Siyasa to Shari'iyah. This amanat, which is the one referred to by Prophet Muhammad in the hadith, in which, is, in which he was asked, when will the hour strike? Mata sa'a, ya Rasulullah, qala idha duyi'atul amana. When amana is betrayed. Wa kayfa idha atuha? How will Amana be betrayed, Ya Rasulullah? He said, Tawseedul Amri ila ghayri ahalihi. When people that do not deserve responsibilities are assigned, when incompetent people are assigned to hold on certain positions in public responsibility, this is Ida'atul Amana, and it is the injustice that nations will never survive. One of the softest ways, Sheikh Usman Lamfodu in the in Bayan Jubil Hijra says, one of the swiftest ways of destroying a kingdom is to give preference to one particular tribe over another, or to show favor to one group of people rather than another, and draw near those who should be kept away, and uh, keep away those who should be brought near. A king was asked after he had lost his throne. What brought your rule to an end? The king replied, he said, being intransigent in my views and neglecting to seek advice. So consultation, seeking advice, and assigning people based on competence and merit to responsibilities is a cornerstone in leadership. I can see that I have taken uh, quite a long time and uh, I, I know there are people who will ask questions and uh, make comments. Uh, so I will have to stop here, not because I have exhausted the discussion on the leadership values and governance, good governance, which they have uh, discussed in many of their books, but I have to stop here. But let me say that uh, if we need for, I mean, for additional knowledge on this subject matter, we may need to refer to Dr. Mahmoud Tukur, leadership, the relevance of values. Uh, it was his um, PhD thesis, which was published as a book with this title, and it was essentially on leadership values as enunciated by the Sokoto Caliphate. Another important reading is uh, the book written by Dr. Hamid Boboi, which is Principles of Leadership According to the Founding Fathers of the Sokoto Caliphate. And perhaps uh, people may also wish to refer to my small book, which uh, the moderator mentioned at the beginning. Uh, that is Engendering Good Governance, the Perspective of the Sokoto Jihad Leaders, that is one. And then there is Social Justice and Leadership Responsibility in Islam, a Primer on Good Governance. Uh, which is a, a bigger one. Uh, but before I end, let me make these quick recommendations. Because of the point I made earlier that leadership crisis has become endemic in our own society, I wish to recommend uh, that uh, first, we Muslim 
community in Nigeria especially, we need to institute what we may call catching them young. We need to institute a purposeful leadership training you know, uh, scheme for our younger ones. Especially, we can de develop models on leadership from these books of the Sokoto Jihad leaders. Let us develop some very simple manuals on leadership, which we should be teaching in our Islamia schools to catch them young because of what I said earlier, that in Muslim organizations, in Muslim societies, there is crisis of leadership. You can see real incompetence in leadership, ineptitude and naivety in leadership. And you can also see selfishness and greed in leadership and even fraud, unfortunately, even in Islamic organizations. So we need to institute purposeful and conscientious, you know, leadership training to younger ones in order to catch them young is very important. And there are a lot of, you know, nusus of the Quran and Hadith and also from sayings of many scholars on the need to, institute, uh, to instill values to younger ones. We have to do this very seriously as a very necessary long-term plan in order to arrest the crisis of leadership in our society. Recommendation number two, this may be considered by uh, the Sultanate Council, we can advance this to the Sultanate Council. Sultan Foundation also may take this as a challenge that we need to institute leadership training institute. Let us establish leadership training institute by the Sokoto Sultanate Council or by the Sultan Foundation or by Usman Amfodio University or by Bayer University Kano. Let us, let us institute some uh, leadership training institute in which the leadership values as taught by these Sokoto Jihad leaders should be the manuals or the modules that should be, uh, you know, we should be training people so that we can be organizing leadership training programs for all categories of people in the society, for newly elected officials at the local government level or at the state level, or even at the national level, for governors, for you know, parliamentarians, and all, all sorts of, you, if, you, if you go close to some of these politicians and you have a discussion with them, you will find that some of them are terribly ignorant about leadership and the essence of leadership and the values of leadership. So we need to take it serious, the need to organize leadership training. Islamic organizations can also be part of the, the trainees, leaders of Islamic organizations. But then Islamic organizations also, like the MSS is doing, MSS is doing well, well in this regard. The Muslim Center Society of Nigeria, they have leadership training program all other Muslim organizations should have leadership training programs. And some of the books written by the Sokoto Jihad leaders in some leadership training programs can be used either as a form of training manual or as a form of ta'alim ta manual, ta'alim bain al-maghrib or ba'da subway in a camping program so that you know, young, young people, uh, Muslim youth will be you know, uh, taught about leadership, will imbibe these leadership values, and so on and so forth. Uh, these are some of the few recommendations I can make. Wallahu ta'ala alam. Thank you for your time. Thank you for listening. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you very much, Professor Salih Sushegu, for this uh, very educative and enlightening presentation. Uh, Alhamdulillah, it's as usual of Professor Salih Sushiku's presentation. Uh, we pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will reward him abundantly for this presentation and will, and will bless the little he has given because he says it's part of it. Uh, I'm sure if he had the time, he would have also spoken for an additional one hour without exhausting the points perhaps he has prepared in the slides. 
May Allah reward you abundantly for this presentation. Actually, I was making efforts for about five to seven minutes to communicate with the host uh, on the issue of time. I wanted to, uh, I, and uh, Alhamdulillah, Prof uh, stopped at the appropriate time. I have uh, gone through the list of participants and I have seen that we have some of our scholars uh, with us. And uh, I have checked whether there are questions. Actually, I have not seen much questions. Uh, perhaps people will raise uh, some questions or send some questions and we will consider them briefly, inshallah. Uh, uh, for those who might also want to raise their hands, they can do so, so that probably will give chances to about three people for, <clears throat> for questions. Before then, we may probably request some of our uh, scholars who are with us to say a word or two as part as comments to the presentation that have been uh, made. But before then, I think it's important to stress some of the points, not necessarily as uh, uh, summarize, I mean, in the form of summarization. Uh, the presentation has dwelt on the issue of good governance. Uh, he said there wouldn't be time, no, there wouldn't be need for defining what is leadership, but he defined good governance and he connects it in the Islamic perspective from a siyasa a sharia, which uh, many scholars of Islam have written about, Ibn Taymiyyah and uh, uh, Sheikh Osman bin Fodi and other scholars have written on, and even currently, presently, contemporary scholars have continued to write about, like Sheikh Yusuf al Qardawi has a book, A Siyasa to Sharia, Fido in Susi Sharia, Omakasidiha. And then he also emphasized the statement of uh, <clears throat> Professor Murelas, one of the leading scholars on the Sokoto Caliphate, uh, on the fact that the Sokoto Jihad was actually a revolution of the young. And therefore, reform is something that is expected to be initiated and executed and managed by the young. And so this is one of the most important lessons we should learn from the legacies of the Sokoto Triumvirate. He talks about also their intellectual contributions, uh, the books they have written in different aspects of life, including, of course, politics, governance, and leadership, which he uh, quoted a number of books that they wrote, which it's important for us as young Muslims trying to bring change in our society to try to read those books and try to see how we can uh, implement them in bringing changes in our society. <clears throat> and then he emphasized the need for catching them young, uh, which he says uh, it's about purposeful leadership training for the young so that we will know the leadership values uh, propagated by those scholars, uh, which are in line with the principles and teachings of Islam, so that inshallah we will produce the next generation of leaders who are qualified in all aspects intellectually uh, uh, and all aspects of the required leadership skills. He emphasized, and I mean, he proposed something very important, which is the issue of having training manuals and establishing a leadership training institute, which he uh, recommended that uh, the Sultan Foundation or the Sultanate Council or Bayro University can or any of the relevant institutions should try to establish so that we will have purposeful leadership training for the young. You can't be a leader without knowing what is leadership. Uh, as somebody says, you, you can't be a leader if you are not a reader. Readers of today are the leaders of tomorrow. And so we need to read about leadership. And of course, we need to be taught about what is leadership. May Allah reward you abundantly, Prof. And inshallah, I hope uh, Amal Aminu Inwa is with us here. I, I, I saw his name, unless if he has left. Uh, he is with Sultan Foundation, and I believe probably he will say a word or two. Uh, I have seen also Dr. Salahuddin Yusuf and uh, Professor Muhammad Babangida and some others. But I think these three, uh, it will be relevant if we can give them, even if it is two minutes, for them to make uh, a comment or two. Starting from Dr. Salahuddin Yusuf. Sir, you are welcome if you are with us. Uh, 
Hello. Mashallah. Hello. Now we can hear you, sir. Can you hear me? We As can hear you. Okay. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I want to commend Professor Salih Shehu for his presentation. Nobody was expecting anything less than what he has done. We know he's very eloquent, very prolific. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward him, give him good health and give him um, a good life. We thank him so much. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Masha'Allah. Uh, okay, the second is Mala Aminu Inwa. I hope Mala Aminu is still with us. I'm trying to look for. Dr. Nabil, you have seen him? I mean, you know, Muhammad should be the name. He's not with us, but you can call Malam, uh, Madam Baba, Muhammad Babangida. Okay, Dr. Muhammad, Muhammad Babangida. Baba Professor Muhammad Babangida. Is Prof. Muhammad Babangida with us? I saw him before, but he... uh, yeah, I, I've still seen his name. Okay, Dr. Nabil. Uh, it's like uh, Professor Muhammad Babangida is also not with us, please. Okay, I have seen Muhammad Babangira, so I thought it's Professor Muhammad Babangira. Huh? He's still there is still Muhammad Babangira. I, I thought it's Professor Muhammad Babangira. Yes, I muted that person, but I think he's uh, maybe attended to something else. Okay, mashallah. Jazakallah. Hello. So I think we can. Okay. Um, let's check those whether there are hands. Well, <laughs> Dr. Rashid Abdul Ghani. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi Wa alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Dr. Rashid, go ahead. Mashallah, Jazakum Allah khairu. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Nabil. Uh, my question, uh, or rather, and, uh, or a call, I don't know, based on my little uh, experience uh, and uh, uh, my present situation here as an uh, academic planning director in Columbia State University, I observed that uh, um, since last year of circulation, uh, proposed review syllabus for Islamic studies, which uh, we made a lot of comments. But up to now, I think the plan is still going on. Actually, the, the entire new syllabus of Islamic studies in Nigeria University is taking totally away all courses related to Sokoto Caliphate and that of um, uh, Kanan Barno. So I don't know, maybe our elder brothers and our fathers are aware of this. And if they are aware, I don't know what have they been doing. We wrote to the NUC, but when they published the proposed uh, syllabus, 
actually the one they sent to us without those courses is still what they are proposing to use. So I don't know, maybe they, they are aware. Actually, the Sultan is presently. Wassalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Jazakallahu khairan. Um, we would also, there is Muhammad Labaran for the given chance, and then Abdullah Yusuf. These two will be given chance for questions quickly. Assalamu uh, alaikum, the moderator. We also have Imam Saeed also waiting for to speak. Okay, he has raised his hand. Anyway, with, with or without raising the hand, we will give him, inshallah. So, what the? Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa alaikum wa alaikum wa alaikum Any challenge? Um, actually, no. I will turn to Professor. Brother, there is challenge. We can hear you. Can we have... Uh, can we have what? Seems you have a uh, connection challenge. Oh, wa alaikum. Wa alaikum Yeah, I think we can go to the next person, Dr. Nabil. Uh, who should I unmute? Uh, I said there is Abdullah Yusuf, and then we give Imam Said. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Assalamu alaikum. We thank Almighty Allah and then very, very appreciative of the presentation of our professor, he's a role model, and then we appreciate the knowledge he has uh, given us or shared. My question has to do with um, Sheikh has raised or has pointed out situations where Muslims are supposed to. Um, ensure there is good governance in community. My question now is, um, as a Muslim community, how, how do you come together? How do you um, form a force to be able to rise to, uh, to take over a political leadership uh, to ensure equity and justice um, in a dominant uh, non-Muslim country or when the, Mus the non-Muslims are at the lead and then there is no good governance. How, as a Muslim community, how do you take over or ensure good governance um, is, is, uh, is done? That's my question. Jazakallah khairan. Finally, we go to the, uh, Imam Saeed. Imam Saeed from Ghana. How are you, sir? MashaAllah. Thank you very much, uh, Prof, for the delivery, and uh, we are so much appreciative. My um, question is How would Professor Salis show um, address the, the, the issue of um, sectarian differences and the namings vis a vis how? what the crisis of leadership that we are having today. I mean, Muslims all over, particularly in the sub-regions, um, will tell you that we have our leaders, <laughs> but the leaders or the leadership is not effective because, in fact, somebody, as I always share, uh, would almost forget that he's a Muslim, but will quickly admit his tag as Sunni, Izala, or something like that, you know? How do we really downplay these differences um, in our quest to overcome the crisis of leadership? That is my question. Zakallah khair. Zakallah khairan, ya Imam. Uh, I think it is actually one of all the questions also I have noted from the chats, uh, inshallah. Uh, most of the questions, uh, some of the questions I saw on the chat 
have already been taken care of by the presentation by Professor Salis Ushehu. So I think we can give him the chance to respond to some of the questions that have been raised here, inshallah. Uh, thank you so much, uh, moderator. And I thank uh, the persons that uh, asked the questions. And uh, I appreciate also the comments, especially the comment made by uh, Professor Rashid Abdul Ghani. I, I think uh, those uh, our, our lecturers in the departments of Islamic studies and also Natais, the Nation, uh, Nigerian Association of Teachers of Arabic and Islamic Studies, should stand up to work together to insist on the need to include uh, the Scottish Caliph's intellectual legacy in whatever form in the syllabus of Islam. But again, one other important thing is that I would like to recommend, I miss this in my recommendations, I would like to recommend to Islamic universities, we have Islamic universities now coming up here and there, I would like to recommend to them that it will be important to include the history of Sokoto Caliphate in their general study programs. Every university has its own general paper, general studies. So like here in Bari University, for example, there is foundation of culture. Under that course, we can put the history of Sokoto Caliphate in that course. But Islamic universities that are coming up, they should try to institute a general course on Sokoto Caliphate so that every student, whether he offers or she offers Islamic studies or not, must know something about the Sokoto Caliphate. It is so pathetic that we, our younger ones do not know our history. You will be surprised that a lady I met who is from Kaduna State, who graduated from Bayer University in 2005. That mean, and she was born in 1982 in Kaduna. That was five years before the creation of Kaduna State. But she even came to the university and graduated from the university, but she didn't know that Kaduna State was created out of Kaduna State. She didn't know that Kaduna State was part of Kaduna State. This is as worse as it is. Even closest of happenings to us, our younger ones do not know, not to talk of history of over 200 years ago. So I think we should take this matter very seriously. And Islamic studies lecturers in this regard are really particularly challenged. The next was the person who asked a, a question about how would we in the Muslim society uh, imbibe these leadership values? I think this lecture and some of the recommendations I made are part of the uh, you know, ways in which we can inculcate these leadership values in people and especially in younger ones, especially the youth that are coming up. Like I said, uh, Islamic organizations should have programs on leadership training because of the importance of leadership. People are just usually assigned leadership positions while they know next to nothing about leadership. So we need to as much as possible, double up our efforts in trying to organize and institute leadership training schemes. Now, about the question that was asked by Imam, uh, Imam Said, I think uh, there is the, the teachings, some of the, the, the teachings, generally the teachings of the Sheikh, I mean, the, the Sokoto Caliphate Triumvirate, if a person consciously studies the books and their writings, you will see that they are not given to extremism in any way. And they are also not given 
they are not given to you know uh, sectarianism that is tasub at tasub yani yani mother to pull ataifi and so on and so forth and they have written in some of their books it's no time to give another lecture but they have written in several of their books about avoiding you know extreme behaviors in almost everything and especially in issues of aqida in issues of relating with the mazahibs and so on and so forth they have written on that i think if we study some of these books that were written by them on these issues that will help us but the most important thing is for a muslim whether he, he, he is a preacher or teacher the most important thing is for a person to actually try to make sure that one you know takes a moderate position in whatever he has moderacy does not mean al-fat or ifrat it does not mean extremism it does not mean laxity wallahu ta'ala alam assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh wa alaykum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh uh before we close in the next few minutes inshallah we i have seen alaji sale kwaru malan sale adam kwaru also raising his hand i think we can give him the chance uh somewhere i spotted someone like professor suleiman abdullah karwai uh probably he will give a remark before uh, we go to the last item inshallah malam sale should be able to Yeah, Malam Saleh Kwaru is. You are unmuted. You can talk now. Malam. 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 Maybe he has a challenge. Maybe he has a challenge. We can't hear you. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam. So I think we can it's like there is challenge and we can give the chance to Professor Karwe. I think it's like I can see Professor Karwe. Professor Karwe has left. Okay. In that case, we can go to the next. What do we have as the last item in our program? Words of thank from uh, Dr. Dukawa. Okay. Dr. Dukawa. Okay. Assalamu alaikum. Rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Uh, alhamdulillah, my task is simple. Uh, I can as well simply have said thank you all. And that will be that for that, about that, in that, regarding that. But I may be found liable for breaching protocol. So in that regard, I will say all gratitude be to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for enabling us to uh, have this session. And uh, after that, I express um, our sincere gratitude to the Islamic Forum of Nigeria management that allowed uh, 
or that uh, took the responsibility of organizing this session. My next thanks goes to our uh, able and erudite speaker, Professor Salis Shehu, for educating the over 120 of us that attended the class. May Allah consider his efforts as part of uh, service to humanity. May he reward him most abundantly. Um, our moderator, Madam Amir Abdullah Hilamito, we thank you uh, for the excellent moderation. Dr. Nabil Bello, who is the chief host, and um, Madam Mustafa Awal, the co-host, have done well in uh, managing the session. Uh, I also thank the over 120 participants who joined the Zoom uh, individually and uh, collectively. Uh, finally, the LOC for it's been uh, that is the local organizing committee is doing a good job since the beginning of this uh, lecture series, and uh, inshallah next week, same time, same day, it's our hope we shall have another series and they will continue the good work they have been doing. We thank them very much, and finally. Uh, I repeat that all thanks be to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wa akhiru da'wana and alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Uh, we thank Dr. Dukawa for thanking everybody also because he has not thanked himself. Uh, MashaAllah. And uh, we apologize for those who might not have the might not have the opportunity might not have had the opportunity to ask their questions. Uh, we hope, inshallah, they can send the questions to us so that, inshallah, in the subsequent lectures, some of these issues might be addressed. I have seen many uh, professors, Ali Sushi, who brought up uh, with us, uh, Barista Kaliri, uh, Abdullah, and many others. Uh, we thank you for participating in this program. Uh, inshallah. Somebody is asking where to obtain some of these books that have been mentioned by Professor Salih Sushehu. Uh, some of them are available for sale, I think, in the Arewa House bookshop, especially uh, that of, I, I used to see this book, Principles of Leadership According to the Founding Fathers of the Sokoto Caliphate at Arewa House, and some other books like, uh, by Simon Bugaje. That of Professor Salih Show, I doubt if it's available in the market, but if you go to the Triple IT library, at least you can get a copy and read, uh, including that of uh, <coughs> Mahmoud Tukur. I believe if you go to Area House, you may get a copy and buy, or at least get a copy and make uh, photocopies. Uh, may Allah reward everybody abundantly. Uh, may Allah guide us as we await the next uh, round of this very important program. Uh, Dr. Nabil, any other announcement? Uh, yes, uh, the only announcement is that uh, uh, next week, because it is going to be Arafat Day, uh, we will not have another lecture. So it will be the following week after, after Salah, inshallah. Inshallah. So what next? We'll take over. Assalamu <laughs> alaikum <laughs>